Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this um, interrogation, as it's called. <laughs> um, I have no idea what that means, but I'm going to introduce, you know, my, my two colleagues, Alex and um, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I'm a, I don't know if you know what I, I used to do for, for a living. Um, I was professor of brewing and distilling. <laughs> 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 at the Harriet Water University for many years. And therefore, I used to produce students, and one of them is the brew dog owner, one of them. Hey. <laughs> Punk IPA. That's yes, that's, that's right. The country's favorite. Um, so I've done something useful <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and uh, I can't mention them without mentioning Stuart Brewing in Edinburgh. And, hey. And West Brewing in Glasgow, I'm associated with those. Oh, yeah. But anyway, we're going to talk about history um, t -t today. And it's, it's about, one may call it, I don't know, the, something about the British Empire. We could talk about it as, we're going to talk about it as slavery. Um, and we're going to talk about it as colonialism. Now, this is um, a very important time because... Um, since the death of George Floyd, um, there's been a complete change in attitude towards uh, this history. And the, the, the way I, I sometimes put it is that, you know, um, race, if I say to you today, to show you how important this is, if I were to say to you today, why am I a different race from you? Anybody who knows that different, could they put their hand up? It's interesting, isn't it? Because that word has killed so many people. <laughs> and you can't tell me why I'm a different race from you. And therefore, what we have is that's the situation. We have a prejudgment. And it goes back to people like Hume, who got up one morning and said, Negroes are inferior to whites. <laughs> he said that. And then Kant came along and tacked it on to an invention called race. So the black race are inferior to the white race, etc. And therefore, we are here where, in fact, that concept drove slavery. It justified it, the enslavement of people as chattel, for which compensation was paid because the people were property. And also in colonialism, it's about you know, the idea of hierarchy the, um, the idea of eugenics, and it's also the idea of um, um, ethnic colonialism. You know, these are concepts which have come out of the fact that people think they're better because their skin color is different and because they've got a castle while somebody lives in a hut. <laughs> that makes them better. It has nothing to do with in capacity and intelligence. And therefore, what we're going to talk about today is something which I've said, you know, we cannot change the past, but we can change the consequences of the past, such as racism for the better, using education. And therefore, what I'm going to do is to discuss slavery in the Caribbean with Alex, and I'm going to discuss colonialism in India referred to as the East India Company, with um, Alex as well. William. William, <laughs> William. <laughs> with William. And therefore, what we have is two aspects of British, um, the British Empire. Slavery, colonialism, the East India Company. And what is interesting about that is that we've got a big statue in the middle of Edinburgh and you all know who that is. <laughs> That's Henry Dundas, the first Lord Melville. And he was president of the Board of Control. That meant he ran the East India Company. And also, 
he managed slavery in the Caribbean. He delayed the abolition of the slave trade for 15 years to benefit slave owners. That meant he stopped Wilberforce from abolishing the slave trade, causing over 600,000 African people to be transported into slavery on the basis of one word, gradual. The slave trades will be gradually abolished. And he got the parliament to accept that. So therefore we have a slavery that is chattel. It is not just minor slavery or modern slavery, it was chattel. And chattel slavery of a black person in the Caribbean meant a person with no right to life and was property, for which 20 million pounds compensation was paid in 1833-34, about 20 billion today. And we have in the East India Company, where Dundas ran it and sent out the Duke of Wellington's brother, Lord Wellesley, to kill the Sultan of Mysore. And there's a large painting in Edinburgh depicting that. So therefore, what we have that's the reality of this history. And William and, and Alex is going to, I'll start with Alex, with his book, The Blood Legacy, which is here, a bit of advertising. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex is, 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 is going to tell you about him, him, his, his, his family and their links and why he wrote his book. So Alex, could you start? Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think I did, why I wrote the book starts with, and as Sarah Helm earlier was talking about being a journalist and coming across a good story, and a good story is one that needs telling, which is how, how she defined it in her earlier talk. Um, and it seemed to me this needed telling. Um, and it needed telling particularly because this is not a story that's over. It's, it's absolutely clear to me, as you've just vividly outlined, that... that Many of the problems around, problems around race and equality and poverty that afflict our society today start in that era and with the decisions that my ancestors, who worked for the East India Company and owned plantations in Tobago and Jamaica, uh, made decisions which were driven by greed. Um, so, but I stumbled across this story in, in my family's archive in, in the house in Ayrshire where my grandparents lived. Um, and realized that very early on as I started to sift through these papers that how ignorant I was, and I who had a, you know, what the British would call a very good in education indeed, um, had grown up knowing really nothing. I knew quite a lot about American slavery. I knew when that ended. I didn't know when British slavery ended. And I wonder how many of you in this room can say when British slavery ended. Um, I didn't know how many people we'd enslaved. And I think most of all, when I finally got to the Caribbean, to Jamaica and Tobago, and started talking to the people on the sites, on the in the places where the plantations had been, where we had, we had squandered the lives of at least 950 people, most of whom lived for only four years on average. Um, when I got to talking to them, I, had, I just, I realized how desperately ignorant I as, the air of the privilege, if not the wealth of this, was about how that control, that history still controlled, still damaged, still, still um, impaired their lives today. Not least because of the racist assumptions that we'd brought along, that people with a lighter skin would have a better job than people with a dark skin because they'd clearly be more intelligent or more loyal. Um, I mean, Willie knows that, you know, we all know that these same rules applied across the whole of the empire. That's how we div divided and ruled was along ethnic and colour grounds, because it worked. And then we left an enormous, enormous detritus in all sorts of countries because those racist conflicts that we used to make profits still transpire today. Um, so that's why I wrote it. But it starts with it being a good story. I hope it's vivid. My um, ancestors wrote letters. This is what the archive is. And, and in reading those letters, the most uncomfortable realisa realisation of all was that I wasn't so very different from them. They were Christians, they were modern, they were highly educated, they were liberals for their time at the beginning of the modern era. I could have sat down and shared a joke with them. The jokes in their letters are rather funny. 
And I had to then confront the fact that these weren't monsters from another past. They were people like me and I myself, given peer pressure and family duty, could well have done the same things they did. I could not see myself as exceptional. And these seemed to be things that were interesting and important to say. So there we go. Well, thanks very much for that, um, will you? <clears throat> so um, Alex and I are distant cousins. And uh, between us, we can sort of claim in our genetic line most of the major atrocities of, uh, of colonialism. <laughs> um, the West Coast half of our joint heritage uh, went off and um, became rich on the slave trade, while the East Coast half of the family went off and looted and plundered India. Now, loot, of course, is an Indian word. It was probably the first Indian word to come into English. Uh, uh, loot is uh, Urdu slang for plunder. Uh, and it arrived in English, the English language in the late 18th century on the back of a massive influx of money from India. When the East India Company was founded at the t same year that Shakespeare was writing Hamlet, uh, India, the Mughal Empire, uh, controlled about 40% of the world's gross domestic product, while England, because initially the East India Company was an English affair, uh, controlled about 4% of the world's GDP, a tenth of, of, of the wealth coming out of India every year. Um, by the time that the Raj ended in 1947, those figures had been more or less reversed. India's economy was uh, a pitiful single figure, uh, while Britain controlled just under uh, a quarter uh, of the world's, uh, sorry, just under 40% of the world's trade. And the story of how that happened and how, and Scotland's connection to it is very important because one of the reasons that the union happened, or rather, one of the reasons that the Scottish aristocracy pushed for the union was because their English counterparts were making a fortune already out of both Caribbean slave trade and the East India Company. And the Scottish attempt to keep up the Darien scheme had been this extraordinary uh, and catastrophic failure. So 1707 was the point at which the Scottish aristocracy wanted to get on board that particular bus before it left. Uh, and they did. And Scots flooded into the East India Company, and one of the understandings was that they would get privileged access to the East India Company. As a result of which, by the uh, middle of the century, which incidentally, of course, is uh, just after the 45, when there's a whole lot of uh, Scots badly needing to restock uh, family coffers, um, there are more Scots per capita in the East India Company than there are English. Uh, and that continues to be the case right through to the abolition of the company in uh, 1858. The Scots entered at every level of society. The directors of the company were Scottish. The generals in the company were Scottish. The squaddies marching in line were, uh, were Scottish. The captains captaining the ships were Scottish, to a greater extent than the English. And I'm ashamed to say that many of the worst atrocities committed in India, whether it's the Tipu Sultan's, uh, the attack on Tipu Sultan's capital in, in 1799, or later, the, the mass genocide which took place in North India following what the British still call the, first, uh, call the Indian Mutiny, but which in India is known as the First War of Independence. It's Highland regiments that are committing the war crimes in that. And there are lots of jokes in imperial textbooks about how the mutineers thought that they were, uh, they were women coming to take avenge for the dead women. They, of course, they were kilts uh, and the Highland regiments. And, you know, we're so used in Scottish history to thinking of ourselves always as the victims, uh, as the people who suffered, uh, the people whose freedom was taken away, that it comes as a bit of a shock at first to discover that our ancestors were every bit as bad at every level of society. It's not just the toffs creaming off the, the estates, it's, the, uh, it's the, uh, the common soldiers looting Tipu's palace and across the country there are fantastic bits of, uh, of loot from India uh, in, in houses at every level of society, uh, which occasionally make their way into the sale rooms, and, and so we get to know about them. Everyone wants to think well of their forebears in every country, um, but I think we are unique in this country for our failure to realize 
that uh, our ancestors were uh, responsible for uh, stripping, asset stripping, uh, the richest country in the world and turning it into the poorest, one of the very poorest. Thanks very much, William. Um, what you've, now, they are got, you've got there is, is, are introductions, which some of it might be very surprising. And <coughs> if I go back to Alex, we're going to talk about the Caribbean. I was born in Jamaica. So um, I and my present family still live. My family still lives on Earl Balcaris. You've heard of Balcaris Street in Edinburgh? Well, my ancestors were Balcaris's must have been his slaves because we still live on his plantation in Jamaica called Marshall Penn in Manchester. So that Marshall Penn was one of his slave plantations. And as I say, my present family still live on parts of it. I've been there, I've seen it. Now, what we have, in fact, what William was trying to project in India, the, the dominance of the Scots, in Jamaica, about 30% or more of the slave plantations were owned by Scots. When you consider the population size of Scotland to the rest of England and, 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 I, and, 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 and Wales at the time, 30% of the slave plantations in Jamaica were owned by Scots. I'm Scots descent. Mm -hmm. I may not look it, <laughs> but I, I, I did my DNA some time ago, and my wife, uh, who's got a dry sense of humor, brought in the results, and she said, do you want to hear it? And she said, you're 97% African and I said, what's the remaining 3%? And she said, you're 3% Viking from Shetland. <laughs> I, I just say that I think Both that's... Alex and I are the reverse. Oh, that, yeah. uh, that we, that Alex has... Yeah, I, I, had, I'm, I did mine. We talked about this. And my, I'm 1.6% West African. Okay. And I have a lot of cousins in St. Elizabeth Parish, Jamaica. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have... I have Three percent Bengali and uh, uh, and a lot of cousins in Chandanag. <laughs> I mean, D DNA is beginning to lay, plus the Mughal blood yeah, well, lay out the truth. That's I mean, right. Yeah. And if you if you look at the Jamaica telephone directory, yeah. which I got some time ago, um, I just was curious. It's lateral thinking, and when it arrived, there are over sixty percent of the names, its surnames in the Jamaica telephone directory are Scottish. The same in Tobago. Uh, yeah. Tobago, yeah. Tobago and Trinidad. There are in in the old Edinburgh book mm -hmm. that I remember having at home. There used to be two pages of Drimples. Uh, in the London telephone book, there was half a page of Drimples, including this 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 famous cousin who was a sex change surgeon. But in Tobago and Trinidad, there are twenty pages of Drimples. <laughs> and and it's, it'll make lots of Scots laugh. You know, just the the the, the most common Scots name in Jamaica is Campbell. Well, that's right. There are more Campbells in Jamaica per acre, per, per acre or square mile than there are in Scotland. So, again, what this is telling you is about Scotland's involvement, which we, I don't think you were taught it in schools, that the, the Scotland dominated um, slavery in the Caribbean, and Henry Dundas was, the, at, you know, the, the great... Um, uh, you know, Henry IX or the uncrowned king of Scotland, he ran the Caribbean with a rod of iron. He, mm. he attacked San Domingo, which is now Haiti, and he lost 40,000 British troops in Haiti in order to destroy the French slavery industry there. So again, a lot of people suffered on the basis, as Michael Fry, the historian, says, well, why could we abolish it? We needed the money. And therefore, the Caribbean slavery, which Alex's um, ancestors were involved, could you tell us where they went in, in, in the Caribbean, um, and which islands they? Yes, so, so my, my Ferguson ancestors were very ordinary in the sense of the, the investors in the slavery business. I, I mean, and I, one of the my grandfather said to my mother, don't worry about it too much. Uh, everyone was at it, which in the sense of you know, landed gentry in Scotland was kind of true by the mid-18th mid century. Um, and they invested and then owned half a plantation uh, at a place called Roselle in Jamaica. Uh, the other half was owned by the Hunter Blair family. Um, Sir James Hunter Blair, uh, you'll all know, is, is one of the great provost of Edinburgh. Um, who who started the the Newtown works going with the throwing up of the North Bridge, 
Um, and they also, um, and this is where the story for me got most vivid, uh, sent a, a uh, youngest son, as was common out in 1770, to Tobago, which the British had ne ne nearly taken off, had newly taken off the French. And there he was sent and he bought raw jungle and 70 African people and set about trying to make a plantation from scratch. And he, it's his letters, his his letters back to his brothers full of hope and jokes and despair and fears that 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 are are the gripping story um but they and i mean and they're intriguing because i mean much to my family's relief today because none, none of my many cousins have been very happy about the unveiling of this um you know we didn't make much money it would have been better to have invested in scotland and and the money we made it was nothing compared with the tax money that the British government took off us. And it's said that its slavery industries contributed 12% of British GDP by 1800, which is kind of similar to EIC figures. I think EIC was higher. EIC is higher. Well, I mean, it yeah, ought yeah. to be. But the, the EIC, I mean, this is extraordinary. What's so interesting about the East India Company is it's, in a sense, it's, it's two stories that are incredibly current. It's, it's this story of colonialism and empire, the story which the British, in a sense, tucked into the bottom drawer and tried to forget about uh, yeah. in the, in the post-independence period. Yeah. Uh, but it's also the story of big corporation. Yeah. Uh, and the East India Company was the first great corporation, uh, great only in the sense of, of power. Yeah. Uh, and um, it controlled, at its height, half of world trade yeah. Yeah. Uh, and employed, I can't remember what it is, one in five people in this country, yeah. many of them in this country, yeah. quite apart from the ones sent, sent abroad. Um, and it invented many of the techniques which corporations still use to control uh, parliaments and legislatures. It used, first of all, bribery. Within a century of its foundation in, in 1600, in 1695, the directors of the East India Company are caught bunging bags of cash at MPs in order to, for them to vote for the extension of its monopoly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, they more, the East India Company more or less invents corporate lobbying uh, these big lobbying firms that you get all over the all over the world, but particularly obviously in Washington, most famously, uh, owe their origin to the to the, the 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 pioneering work that the East India Company did. And so, when you get a company like Exxon today uh, that moves in and starts lobbying um, the Republican Party after 9/11, uh, this is the major opportunity yeah. to take Iraq uh, and and plays golf uh, with the main uh, uh, with the main. Um, uh, figures in Washington. Uh, th these are all using techniques that the, uh, yes. the East India Company develops yes. to, to in, in this battle between state and corporation. Yes. And I think the, the West India Society of Planters, mm -hmm. very big lobbyists who learned from the mm -hmm. EIC about how, to, from John Company, about how to do it when it came to lobbying against abolition and then lobbying to get this unbelievable payout, the 17, 20 billion that mm -hmm. Jeff mentioned. Um, right at the end of slavery, which was essentially the biggest transfer of funds from the government to a special interest group in the entire 19th century. An interest group, including my ancestors, who were already among the richest people in the world. Yeah, the, it's the extraordinary it's, fact it's, that it's, the, yeah. it's not the slaves getting the compensation, no, no. it's the owners. <laughs> no, and, and one, of, one of the, in a way, I mean, well, well, I have very mixed feelings about my ancestors, who I was brought up to kind of worship and respect, and in many, and they were philanthropists and soldiers of the empire as well. But one of the, the, the thing where, the place where one's anger starts to rise is, is that later on, so Sir Charles Darimple Ferguson lived at New Hale's house that you'll know outside Musselburgh, um, and he, this, there are statues to him, um, famous um, throughout in Ayrshire and the Lothians for building schools and um, churches, particularly for the poor fishermen of, of, of East Lothian. And when he, bit, which he used presumably part of the three million payout the two families shared at compensation, but not a single school did he build for the 200 enslaved people who were left landless, penniless and uneducated at the end of slavery on his plantation. So that gap, and he was an elder of the Church of Scotland, he was a theologian, he wrote theolo he was, he was mm. the theological tracts. I mean, that gap as a Christian comes back to the race issue to me because it seems to me he had to, they had, could only have behaved like that if they believed that black people were not just less good, but less than human. Yeah. And there is this whole idea, you know, we, we're also brought up to think of 
<coughs> the Nazis as the people that invented scientific racism, but yes. almost all the main ideas of this hierarchy of races mm -hmm. you see being developed over the 18th and 19th century by, yeah. by British thinkers. And um, there's, after the crushing of this great rebellion in 1857 in India, the largest anti-colonial revolt in world history, with, where you know, certainly two or 300,000 innocent people are, are, are wiped out, by, often by Highland regiments in the retributions, none of which is ever taught in British schools. Mm. Um, after that, you get these books produced, giving hierarchies of races, yes. and, and, and you know, the, the, the blacks at the bottom, then you get sort of gypsies, then you get, and, and the, all this stuff which later yeah. you know, ends up in Germany has its origins yes. with us in, in, in an extent that we've totally yeah. chosen to forget. Mm -hmm. Satnam, have you read Satnam Sangeri's Empire Land? Oh. You oh. have, I know. <coughs> really, really, it's written from the very a brilliant book, uh, came out earlier this year, written from the perspective of, of uh, a man who, uh, who grew up in Wolverhampton, born and grew up in Wolverhampton as, as a Sikh, um, and, and a study of empire from that point of view. Because he makes the point, I'm a patriotic Briton, I love this country, and I'm here because of empire. That's what brought me. Mm -hmm. So people telling him to go back where he came from, it's a bit, a bit pointless. But Satna makes a brilliant point that, that he, he, his family became Sikhs for the same reason there's a Sikh outside every posh hotel in India guarding the door with a big moustache mm -hmm. and a turban. Because the British, completely at random, as I understand it, decided to make the Sikhs the warrior caste the, who they would trust. So his family and loads of others went, oh, we'll convert to Sikhism because clearly you can get a better job. Yeah. I, I think, you know, what, what has just been said was about the, that slavery and that colonialism, as Michael Friday Storen says, it's about money. It was about running this country. You know, for example, we've got a linen bank in St. Andrew's Square. Well, of course, in 1750, um, and up until 1838, when slavery was abolished in the Caribbean, Britain, which Scotland was a part of, owned 800,000 slaves. Hmm. So British slavery, at the end of slavery, there were 800,000 black people who were slaves in the Caribbean. And therefore, when compensation was paid, the largest recipient of compensation for slaves as property was John Gladstone, who was born in Leith. And he's the father of the great prime minister, William Gladstone who was a prime minister and he was Scottish. I think his seat was in Midlothian. So what you have is the largest recipient of slave compensation money was a Scot. <laughs> and he got 83 million in today's money for 2,508 slaves. And how did he spend it, Jeff? I don't think he spent it in Jamaica yeah. or the Caribbean. I don't. Fast, I fast never had any. It's Fask House, isn't it? It's in Aberdeenshire. Yeah. Well, yeah. he bought Fask. Yes, yeah. right. Fask House or Castle, which I've been to, mm. and it, um, it. They also own the village of Fask, the the Gladstone family. So you know what we're trying to say is that did you know all that? This is the point about this 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 this, this meeting or this discussion. It's about a history that, um, when I speak about it, but people usually say, but miners were slaves, or what about modern slavery? It's this balance. You cannot balance evil. You cannot balance somebody when you've killed them with building them a school or a road. Yeah. And therefore, that's why we're talking about this slavery now. It's about, you know, we cannot change the past, but we can change the consequences of the past, because some people say, that's the past, let's forget it. But the past has consequences. I was in London the other day, and I met a little black boy receiving an award, and he was stabbed four times, you know, um, by another black boy. And the point is that these are the consequences of that history. And therefore, these are things which we can address through the curriculum, um, and that's what the Scottish government, I've noticed, has just put out a statement that this history is going to be taught in, 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 in schools because we need it to change attitudes. You know, um, uh, um, uh, why do we need to change that? I went to give a talk two years ago in the Edinburgh Festival, and 
the attendant, when I walked in, said, can I help? And I said, yeah, um, I've come to give a talk. And the person said, um, what time? And I said, two o'clock. And the person said, well, you can't be giving that talk at two o'clock because that talk is being given by Professor Sir Jeff Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, that is the consequence of that slavery. Yeah. It is where I cannot be seen to be that person. Yeah. I should be running a bus or sweeping the streets or something. In another incident in an institution in Edinburgh, I went to meet the, 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 the boss. And when I arrived, the young man said, can I help? And I said, yes, I've come to see the boss. And I said, he said, how do you come to know the boss? I said, I, I've known the previous boss, you know, and I've been associated with this place for a long while. And he said, the previous boss, were you his chauffeur? And this is how serious this um, history is. It's about prejudgment, the human concept of inferiority. Nabarro, when I was a young man in London in the 60s, Nabarro, the politician, used that to say, how would you like a big black guy? How would you like your blonde daughter to bring home a big black guy? And what he was doing is paying on the prejudice of inferiority. You don't want your little daughter to marry a black guy who is dangerous and, in fact, um, you know, probably is going to be selling drugs or whatever. And these are the prejudices and the history which Alex and William is trying to tell you is where your prejudices come from. They, they were, they're cultural, they're transmitted like genes. They're passed on. And the fact is that to change them, we've got to educate the children. And also to speak to you. Yes. That how we can change the attitudes because they result in poor representation. I did some work for the NHS Edinburgh and the Lothians. They, uh, but it, things can change because we only had four managers of BAME in the NHS Edinburgh and the Lothians. And we set up a course and I developed the concept called system consciousness in terms of becoming aware of what the system expects. And within three years, we went from four to about 25 BAME managers. So you can change attitudes if people become aware of their prejudices and stop using them to stop people from helping to manage the society because a diverse society needs diverse management to be fair and efficient. And we could say the same about women a while ago, that we have more women managing the society and it's better for it. And that's what we're now saying about black people or non-white people in terms of the management of our society. Now, Alex, could you pick that up? I was going to say, do you think, do you think that, I mean, can I ask a question of you and William, and do you think that actually both with the Indian story and the transatlantic chattel slavery story, we, we need a more formal process than just acknowledging the history? We actually need a, re a reconciliation process, a reparative justice process. There is, I know, because I've talked to them, there are people in the Caribbean who have asked to start talks about this. Could you take that first, will you? It's, it's a very difficult one, this. Um, I think the first thing, in, in a sense, is education. You can only get the people of this country to get towards reparations or returning museum objects or um, uh, well, a whole range of responses to this when people realize what has happened. And at the moment, in most uh, school curriculums, you jump from, certainly in England, you jump from the Tudors and the Stuarts to Hitler with a little stop off on Florence Nightingale and the emancipation of the slaves giving the impression that this island story has been one of, uh, of a fight for liberation and freedom. Uh, and at every stage, we've been on the side of the angels, uh, yeah, seeing off racists left, right, and center. So 99% of people, not 99% of people, but I'd say a huge proportion of people in this country just simply do not understand 
the truth mm. of the guilt mm. of their mm. ancestors. They don't understand what's happened. And therefore, they're nowhere near mm. uh, giving objects back for museums or, uh, or, or agreeing to, uh, to reparations because there's such ignorance. Yeah. And there was this, I think, this very sort of British deliberate amnesia mm. to empire. Uh, in the uh, in the post-war period, it was like uh, an individual putting a chest up into the attic yeah. and, and not getting it. Yeah. Pictures were taken down from public collections. A lot. There's been a lot of talk this week about the retreat from Afghanistan mm -hmm. and the and, and the complete mess we left there. Uh, and there'd be many uh, articles in newspapers showing the famous picture of the of, of the, the one man surviving on the retreat yeah. from Kabul uh, on, on his on his on his nag. <laughs> and uh, also the, the, the last stand of the 51st at Gundamuk. Now, those paintings were two of the most popular paintings in the Tate in the 19th yeah. century. But in but the they 50s... They were about imperial failure. They were about imperial failure, and yet, yeah. bizarrely, they were about imperial heroism and, yeah. and it got sort of, you know, that strange term that was made of, of these defeats. And they got taken down, and the, and the, the, the story of the, of the picture of Dr. Bryden... Lady Butler's last of an army, remnant of an army, got sent off to a regimental museum in Somerset. So all this stuff that was there in the 19th century, yeah, it was lost. tub thumping for empire, disappeared from view, with the exception, of course, of the statues, mm. which still sit in Trafalgar Square and all over Edinburgh and all over, uh, including, you know, in the middle of Glasgow, one of the greatest war criminals of, of, of British history, uh, Campbell, who, who, who made the mutineers in the sepoys uh, in India lick up the blood of the murdered women of the Bibigar and sewed them up in pigskins and blew them from the mouth of... I mean, a long list of very... He's sitting in the middle of, uh, in the middle of Buchanan Street. Um, and and without a, without a, uh, without a, a plaque or any explanation or anything, and and you know there are versions of this across the country. Well, anyway, so I think yeah, we're sorry. near question time. Um, so what I'll do, I'll just wrap up because we're going to ask uh, questions. But just about the reparation, uh, quickly. I don't want you to forget that Glasgow University. I did some work with them, and they looked at their slavery history, and and published that they received about two hundred million from slavery, some of the a, a, a great slaver, um, Cunningham Graham was their rector, and they still have a scholarship uh, mm. related to him. And they decided that they were going to do reparation in terms of education, and they've set up links with the University of the West Indies. And I've met a professor from there who is working with Glasgow <coughs> University in terms of educational reparation. And they are setting up small scholarships in order to try and help black kids in the UK. And you get the individual situation where a member of this panel is supporting one of my old churches in Jamaica <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of helping with the church. So you can have a small thing like that or the Glasgow thing, which is formal. But any individual can make that their own uh, uh, reparations if they like. And I think that... The, 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 I told the historians once, that the, by not telling the Scottish people their history, it was insulting, mm. because they believe you couldn't take it. <laughs> I'd completely agree with that. And, and I mean, because we've mentioned Michael Fry several yeah. times, but, but Michael Fry's, I just realised this the other day, Michael Fry's new edition of his one volume, Acclaimed History of Edinburgh, which is on the front table of every bookshop in Edinburgh at the moment, just come out again in paperback, does not mention the word slavery in the index or in the text. Yeah, Just yeah. as our island story, which we all, many of us well, grew up with, has half a page titled How We, how we Helped Free the Slaves. Well, we, so denialism and misinformation, I mean, I was let down by historians on this and on, and on the empire, and, there's, and actually, they're still doing it. Well, we need to call this out. Well, Henry Dundas, um, if you look at Henry Dundas and what he did, yeah. Tom Devine's The yeah. Scottish Nation, he's not mentioned in terms of gradual abolition yeah. of the slave trade. But anyway, I've got to start the question. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Should I say something quickly about reparations? Yeah, One of the great things, I mean, the happiest things about publishing this book is that I am getting um, two or three emails a week from, from people going, I've, my, I'm uncomfortable, I realise my family, I've always known my family had a similar history. Are there things we can do about it? So on the book's website, there is a list of charities... In, the, in Jamaica and Tobago and, and in UK, that, that, that increasing numbers of families with this history are, are supporting it. It's token, but it's, it's the beginning of the discussion about 
trying to, as you say, change the consequences. And I would urge any of you, and there will be people in this, people in this room, go to the UCL, University College London Legacies of British Slavery website, put in your surname, and just start to have a think about what it means now in 2021. To, to do the India side of the story, I sat on this stage five years ago with Shashi Tharoor, who wrote the book Inglorious mm -hmm. Empire. And he's, his view is always that, you know, uh, it, it, they don't want money uh, no, in India. So what they want, they said, they said there maybe should be one, one pound of token reparation, but what they really want is acknowledgement. Yeah. Of, of, of what was and an apology for what was done, yeah, exactly um, the same and thing. that has never been done. And even something like the the Amritsar massacre, which you'd have thought would be a completely open and yeah. open case, innocent people went for a picnic. They were mown down by machine guns, uh, and it's a very and every time that a, a monarch goes to India or a prime minister, they lay a wreath. Do they apologise? No. And it's not difficult to say <laughs> we're sorry that we committed a war crime and massacred yeah. thousands of innocent people. Oh, it's, okay, it's thanks crazy so much, that, William. Yeah. Could I ask for a question? <laughs> um, could I, uh, Lots of could questions. We, could you call and, and pass the mic, please? To Professor Palmer's opening question, and it's a comment I'd like to make rather okay. than a question. And you asked about racism. Mm -hmm. And personally, I always think that having uh, anti-race attitudes is due to a lack of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Due to ignorance, rather, a lack of education. And you've referred to education. Mm -hmm. And because I have this very strong approach to any uh, racial uh, approaches. I read a book by, I think it was a chap called uh, Harari, called The History of Humankind. And I think in education, you have to go that far back, not into middle history, but into the roots of our origins. And if you do that, you'll realize, <coughs> as I did, that we all come from the same root. And so we're all interconnected. And what we've evolved as over time with different skin color, etc., is just a result of what has happened over that time. And I think if more of us studied that and realized that, then racial attitudes might be helped to disappear. Thank you. Anybody else? follow that up because I, I, I somewhat disagree with the lady because I used to work training people in e equal opportunities and things like that through the Scottish Wider Access Programme and one of the courses I ran was for multicultural education officers in the city of Glasgow and I split them into three groups and I gave them three student CVs and I said we'll get back together and we'll look at the different advice you've given to students. What I didn't tell them was one was obviously a white guy by his name one was obviously a white woman by the name, and the third one was a, a, an, a, an Asian woman. When we came back together, these are all the right-on guys who know all about multicultural education. They came back and they had three different, completely different sets of advice, depending on whether it was a white guy, a white woman, or a, or a woman from India. And I think we've got really these prejudices and assumptions are so deeply ingrained that we're actually not aware that we're actually doing it even when we're people who care about these things and, and, and work mm -hmm. in the right on way with students. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I want to make a comment, really, which I thought would interest you that I... Is that all right? Is that OK? I'm a history graduate of UCL, and I went to a lecture by Dr. She's now Professor Catherine. I've forgotten her third name, so I'm very tired. <clears throat> when she was starting the legacy thing, an extraordinary thing, it's a few years ago, and it might have been revised since, but she actually said they think about 25% of the country, it might have been an inheritance from a great aunt, that 25% of us are actually contaminated by this, which is Scots or British? British. Yeah. And the other thing I would just say, I think um, it's obvious, you know you can regret, but if you apologise, you have to pay money, and that is, I think, <laughs> why they don't do it, is it not? <laughs> okay. No questions. Yes. Yes, sir. I'll hand behind you as well. Thank you. I heard a, a programme on the radio about 18 months ago, 
where someone who had relatives who were slaves were demanding from the churches who had benefited so much that they make reparations and send money back. And the representative from the church was just saying, no, that's impossible. But I thought that was quite a uh, reasonable uh, demand to kind of make. So I wonder what the uh, panel think of that. OK. There's a question behind, behind us. We'll, we'll deal with that afterwards. Um, there's a hand on the right, down there. Uh, not down there on your right. Uh -huh. Yeah, OK. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, I, very quickly, although I would never, ever take issue with Willie on any moment in history, <laughs> but I would say your opening Willie. remark <laughs> about, the, <laughs> about the Scots aristocracy being overwhelmingly, pro being all before, before the Union is not true. Uh, a large proportion of the Scots aristocracy and gentry were against it, including my family, who rose four to three times in rebellions, one practically much on their own. When the game was up, they went into the sugar business with great success as merchants and as planters in Jamaica. And my belief about these origins of the racial theories is not that it comes before empire. It comes with it. It comes as an excuse for it mm -hmm. so that we can excuse our actions mm -hmm. when we suddenly go from one world that we knew into another world where we're suddenly making lots of money. And sorry, I'm afraid um, mm -hmm. the Sterlings did make money, I think largely for being merchants as well. <laughs> and the other thing I would slightly take issue with is at the end when you were talking about the disappearance of empire is that we're a huge amount of people for whom empire was absolutely fresh in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, the 80s, 90s. They're probably only just dying off now. And, there was a, and because it was across society, this experience, particularly boosted by the experiences of the Second World War, although it may be disappearing from the public perception, the private perception in every family and huge amounts of families in this country, Scotland as well as England, but I would say proportionally much more in Scotland, was of these memories of empire and the attitudes that probably went with them. So my um, final thing on this is that I think that um, a huge amount of education needs to go in. I don't know where you guys went to school. I was taught about the triangular trade when I was 10, and I knew about <laughs> my family's involvement in slavery uh, a little later. Uh, it was documented in the family papers and letters. Um, the idea of this is that all of this happened while we were also creating the modern world. Nearly everyone in this room would not be here, but for the advances paid for by slavery. And what is awful about the race question now is that those people who suffered most in making this modern world, in making a world of comfort and maybe polluting as well, whatever, nothing's altogether good, are the people who've been disbarred, by and large, from benefiting from it. Mm. And if it wasn't for the color of their skin, we would have no idea who had been a slave 200 years ago. And so, in, in my view, the evil of racism today is based on an ignorance about everyone, from the person who put in capital, from the awful man who cracked the whip, to all the people who were transported from Africa, to the people who sold them. All of these people contributed to the modern world. Every, and however evil all of lot, a lot of it was, everyone who has been through that needs to be able to have an equal chance of benefiting from it. Could we have... No, right, we'll, we're gonna, we'll, we're gonna, should we do an answer? Because my brain will get fuddled. OK, <laughs> just, just one more <laughs> over there. Hi, my name is Wesley. I'm a uni uh, student at the University of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say that I find it funny that we're all here discussing race relations, yet we only have one person of color on stage. <laughs> and so I guess my main question is, how do we make sure that platforms of education you know, things that will help us make reparations, how do we make sure that there's representation for people of color? Because if we're constantly being told our history, the history of my people, from the view of 
a white person, a white male, I don't think I could ever really understand. And I think that's part of the root of the problem. So how do we make sure that, okay. how do we make sure that representation is put forward? Understood. Well, just two questions. We'll deal with that. But do you want to take up the gentleman's position at the back there? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to say, so, yeah. I mean, firstly, to, to, to um, the person that just there who just stood up about that. I mean, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I, I, I'd defend my position on this stage because I am writing specifically, my book is about being the heir of enslavers. In a sense, only I can write this particular book. But I have, and it's been a real lesson for me, I, I've done a dozen events, since, as you do, since the book's published, a lot of them online and so on. And I've had to say, often, to, to institutions, why are there only white people on my panel? I don't want to do it if it's only white people on my panel. And, and people have gone, oh, well, we don't know. I mean, literally someone said to me, this is an academic institution, there aren't that many black people in Scotland you can, who would be suitable for the panel. So it goes with some of the stories you've said. Now, now Jeff and I, this is the third panel we've done together, mm -hmm. and that maybe says something as well. Um, I want to, to, to say the, to the gentleman yeah. over there, to, to Willie Athol, um, I do think one of the, you know, we talk about how memory of the empire and lived on in, in our parents' generation and so on, and this sort of nostalgia for it and this sort of sense that it was still there and important. I, I find it very important, you know, I, I've said to quite a lot of older white people who go on, who, who talk about empire and the loss of it and their nostalgia and their feeling that it's been its memory has been betrayed. Look around you in this society. The in, in a way, the best thing that came out of empire is around us, less so in this room than in many cities. But it is the multicultural society in which we live. People are here because of the empire. Um, and we need, to, when we complain about, as British people have, about them coming and taking our jobs, which you can still hear today, you remember why they're here and what brought them here. Day. Um, okay. Could we? Uh, and the, the, I'll leave minutes. the church to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, just just quickly, um, I think we've I've told we've only got three minutes. We probably <coughs> can take a Sorry. little bit longer. Um, but for the gentleman over there, the the point is that all the people who were involved, he was trying to say, um, what we've got today is the results of everybody who was involved. Uh, the problem is, is that some people benefited more than others. And some people are still being crucified. It is the racism of Hume that killed Floyd. The policeman with his hand in his pocket, thinking nothing's going to happen because he's white. And therefore, the, it, it, we've all contributed, but we're not all benefiting. And for the young lady over there, that's absolutely your right. I don't want to sit up here anymore. <laughs> I, I would hope that we get other people. But I truth should come out of anybody's mouth. It doesn't, our history doesn't have to be true because it comes out of my mouth. We've got to learn that like in science, a four is a four. There's not a white four and a black four. <laughs> and therefore, we must get people to speak the truth. I don't accept what Tom Devine said last week. Every historian is biased. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's completely unacceptable. And therefore, we want the truth, and the truth can be spoken by anybody. It doesn't matter what color they are. Mm. And therefore, yes, we want more representation, um, because as I said, a diverse society is more efficient with diverse management. I don't want a black and truth, and, a, and I don't want a black truth and a white truth. I just want truth. And it doesn't care who speaks it. Mm. Um, if, a, if I'm sick, and there's a white doctor and a black doctor, I don't care if their abilities are the same. And therefore, with the church, you're right, I've got a church in Jamaica which I still support. And of course, the church were involved because it was, uh, th this slavery was legal. And the point is people, in fact, I think it was James Bailey from the Bailey family in Inverness, where he said, all abolitionists are low men because he was saying they were trying to break the law by abolishing slavery when it was legal. And therefore, we have these anomalies. You'll find that Dundas said it was terrible slavery, 
but we got to gradually abolish it. And what you find is that if you read the history of the past, you know, one person will say it is terrible, but we've got to do it. So, but what the historians have done is only presented the fact that they said it was bad. Mm. They didn't say what they did. And therefore, what the public needs is the truth. And therefore, as I said before, the Scottish people are big enough to take their own history. And they don't need historians manipulating it because, as Divine says, you couldn't take it. And I think, don't think that's true. Mm. Thank you.